On May 28, 1884, an article titled Mr. Solomon's Temple was printed in the Boston Globe. It opened up with a pretty simple little line. My intention was to go to Tatnik and write up the hermit. Well, hey, what a coincidence. That's my intention too. I'm out here in the woods of Tatnik, Massachusetts to tell you about the hermit, or more specifically, a very remarkable landmark that the hermit left out here in the woods for us to find. Now, normally the start of the video here is where I give you like a little introduction to the story, maybe some background information, start setting everything up. But you know what, since our author over here is off to such a good start, I think I'm just gonna let them take the lead on this one. So let's just keep reading. Despite living in Boston, less than 50 miles from Tatnik, our author has never heard of the place before. He has to get out a map to even figure out what general area Tatnik is in. Eventually he learns that it's right here, just outside of Worcester, Massachusetts. Me and the author are on the same boat on this one. I live less than an hour away, but I've never heard of Tatnik either. Once I got there, I could kind of see why. I mean, it's a pretty tiny little pocket of the wider Worcester metro area without too much of anything going on. They got Worcester State University and that's pretty much it. By the way, I really wanted to be able to show you some kind of big like, welcome to Tatnik sign or like anything that had Tatnik on it and like big giant letters, but I've been all over town for the past like hour or so. Can't find anything like that. So you're gonna have to settle. for this nursing home sign. <laughs> After locating Tatnik, our author arrives via train in nearby Worcester, where he'll need a horse and carriage team to get around. There are plenty of good teams in Worcester, and one was soon at my disposal, with a driver to thread the labyrinth of the Tatnik roads. The driver was a long, lank, cadaverous youth with an expressionless face and a weeping eye. All right, I better pause here and tell you that although this is first and foremost an article about a very strange landmark here in Tatnik, it's also about some very eccentric characters that the author met on his trip out here. This young driver who apparently had the look of a corpse is only the first. The article continues. Which way is Tatnik from Worcester? I inquired as we drove out into the main street. Most anyway, answered the lank youth solemnly. You drive out of Worcester in any direction and you see a guideboard stuck up saying five miles to Tatnik. Okay, so this is a pretty funny exchange where the author asks a simple question and gets kind of a nonsense answer in return. Like no matter what direction you leave Worcester, you're somehow always gonna end up in Tatnik according to our driver. Nowadays though, I gotta say, this kind of conversation would never really happen. Much like most of the small towns that used to be on the outskirts of bigger settlements, Tatnik has since been absorbed by the creep of Worcester's development. It's not even legally a separate town anymore, just a neighborhood in Worcester. The author soon learns that Tatnik is hardly what you would call a thriving community. They don't really have a main street or even a post office. Just a box in a shed where somebody comes over from Worcester and dumps the mail once a day. Then the Tatnik residents come shambling out from the woods to sort through it themselves, checking every letter for their own names. Funnily enough, even in 2022, Tatnik still doesn't technically have a post office. This is the closest one right here, which is actually just a little bit outside of the official boundaries of the neighborhood. The author tells the driver that he's looking for the hermit. And the driver asks him, which one? Tatnik is full of hermits. The author says he'd like to see whichever one is closest. And they set off down the road with the driver constantly wiping liquid from his eyes. They look across the landscape. After traveling for a while, the buggy pulls up in front of a small farmhouse with a woman sewing in the window. The driver calls out to her, asking how far away the hermit is, and 12 other heads quickly pop into the window, curious who the strangers are. The woman replies that the hermit lived just up the road a bit, but that he wouldn't be home at the moment. His name was Mr. Clark, and he worked distributing advertisements in Worcester. The author is quite confused by that. How can Mr. Clark be a hermit if he goes to the city every day to work a full-time job? He asks the woman why the people of Tatnik call Clark a hermit, and she says that she doesn't know. And to be honest, I don't really know either. The Mr. Clark being referenced here is a guy named Andrew Clark, who I was actually able to find like a decent amount of information on. 
but as best as I can tell, he's called the Hermit just because he lived out in the woods in a little stone shack for a couple years while he was recuperating from a life-threatening illness. So the guy just went out to the woods to get a little fresh air while he recovered, and that was enough for him to be known as the Hermit for like the rest of his life. Like, here, look at some of this stuff I found. This is pretty crazy. Like, I found this one book from 1889, right? It's called The Dictionary of Worcester. And it just kind of, it's like an encyclopedia that goes over like a bunch of famous people and places and stuff like that in Worcester's history, right? Like, look, let me read you a few of the entries. Under P, we got Princeton, a town 14 miles north of Worcester. Under R, we got the Worcester Rifle Association. It's got a range on Haywood Street. Hey, good to know. And then under H, we got Hermit. Worcester once enjoyed the distinction of possessing, among other unrivaled attractions, a real hermit who lived among the rocks near the summit of Rattlesnake Hill. <laughs> now look at this one. The Worcester Hermit lived in a stone hut at this place. Look, that's even capitalized. It's a proper noun. The Worcester Hermit. They're treating this like it's Mr. Clark's like professional title or something. And then even here in the dictionary, they say that while Mr. Clark was living out in the woods, he was visited all the time by townsfolk. And by the time that this was written, uh, he had given up being a hermit. You know, he'd lived in the city for like 10 years at this point, but nope, doesn't matter. Forever, you're just a hermit, hermit now. Doesn't matter if you were in contact with people the entire time you were in the woods. Doesn't matter if you got a full-time job. Doesn't matter if you're completely integrated back into society. You're out in the woods for a couple years and you are now the dictionary definition of hermit. You are capital W, capital H, the Worcester Hermit. After the author asks the old woman in the window why Mr. Clark is considered a hermit, she says, I don't know. Because he used to live up in the woods, I suppose, on Mount Horeb, by Solomon's temple, on the land deeded to the Lord by Solomon Parsons. You go up by Rattlesnake Hill, and you'll see the ruins of the old stone house he used to live in. Who is Solomon Parsons? Uncle to Mr. Clark. What sort of man is Mr. Clark's uncle? Well, someday when you happen to be sitting by the window, if you see an old gray-headed man drive by, with rubber boots on in the middle of the summer and a harness made of rope and chain and such like. That's old Solomon Parsons. And here we are being introduced to Solomon Parsons, one of the most unique individuals to ever walk the woods of Massachusetts and the central character to this whole story. Here's the only picture of him I could find. The woman continues to talk about Solomon. He won't eat no meat, he won't have anything to do with any leather or anything else which comes from animals because he believes it is wrong to kill them. He built Solomon's temple and has meetings there Sundays. Nobody goes, but that don't make no difference to him. This is all completely true. The man was undoubtedly a devout vegetarian, living for years off of nothing but fruits and nuts. Same with the harnesses too. Almost all animal harnesses at the time were made of leather, so I'm sure it was quite the sight to see Solomon going down the road with his made of chain. I even found one pretty funny little story where Solomon decided to experiment with rubber harnesses, right? Like apparently he strapped in his horse to a wagon, set the horse off, and the rubber just stretched and stretched and stretched without the wagon actually going anywhere until the rubber harness just snapped. The author and driver asked the woman where they could find out more about Solomon Parsons, and she directed them to go and visit a man named John Porter who lived just a little ways down the road. They found the place without much issue. John Porter was upstairs eating his dinner when I went in, and from the dialogue I heard on the second story landing, I gathered that he was somewhat loath to be interrupted. There's a gentleman downstairs from Boston who wants you to tell him about Mr. Parsons, yelled the landlady. Go round on the other side of me and say it in my other ear, was the equally audible reply. As John Porter came down the stairs, he continued yelling in confusion, worrying our author. But as soon as Porter came into view, he greeted our author with nothing but warmth. And now we come to another colorful character, Mr. John Porter. Fortunately, I wasn't able to find anything too detailed about his life, but we don't really need it. As you'll see, there is plenty in this article to paint a picture of the man. Come way up here from Boston to find out about Solomon Parsons, eh? He burst out with an overwhelming cordiality. 
Well, I can tell you as much as anybody, I guess. I've often been up to the temple Sundays when I couldn't get to my own church in Worcester. It ain't no temple, you know. Built out of stones with a big bonfire in the middle to warm your feet on. Well, now I believe I'd like to drive right up along with you and show you the whole place. The author quickly accepted Mr. Porter's offer to see the temple, and Mr. Porter began to get ready for the trip. He took a pile of clothing on his arm and went out of the front door. I suppose he was going to get into the carriage and dress himself on the road, but no. He started off across lots to a barn about a mile away, and in a few minutes after he reached it, we saw him emerge again. He'd undergone a transformation. He was dressed in a smart swallow-tailed coat of an antique cut, with a broad-brimmed beaver hat, brushed the wrong way of the fur, and a phenomenal pair of shoes. Am I crazy, or does that not just sound completely insane? He ran a mile across his property just to get changed in some random barn? Like, <laughs> the article makes it very clear that Mr. Porter is like an old man, so like, realistically, how fast could he possibly go a whole mile across some fields just to get to his special changing barn? Like, were the driver and the author just standing there, like, watching this guy just go further and further into the horizon? Like, didn't even turn to each other to ask, like, what's this guy doing or anything like that? They just sat there for, like, 45 minutes waiting for this dude? Like, I don't know. I feel like there must be some, like, old antiquated definition of mile or like a regional definition or something that I just don't understand and that's probably why this doesn't make much sense but I don't know for all I know maybe this dude really was like oh yeah Solomon's temple oh I'll take you there no problem be right back and so the driver the author and Mr. Porter rode along through the hills and woods of Tatnik on route to Solomon's temple so you're from Boston, Mr. Porter asked the other two men. You know, I went to Boston 55 years ago and saw somebody named Old Tuck. I bet you know Old Tuck, don't you? The driver told Mr. Porter that he'd never heard of an Old Tuck, which the former seemed shocked to hear. That's funny, said Mr. Porter, incredulously. Thought everybody knew Old Tuck. I just love this part, right? Like the guy's like, oh, you're from Boston? That city of over 300,000 people? Oh, well, uh, you know, young man, over half a century ago, I went out there and met this dude named Old Tuck. You know Old Tuck, right? Everybody knows Old Tuck. Mr. Porter goes on to explain to his companions that he doesn't get out of the Worcester area much anymore. I don't move much. It's on account of my feet, partly. My leg took a notion of swelling. First she'd swell, and then she'd shrink, and I couldn't make her out at all. I'm trying a new salve on my feet today. The kind I've been using was too much like lard. But this is stiffer and hangs on better. By the way, if you don't know what salve is, it's basically just another word for like ointment or cream. It's gonna come up a lot while we're talking about Mr. Porter. Eventually, the men turned off the main road into a small cart path, winding its way up the hills and deeper into the woods. And that's where we are right now and where I've been filming most of this video so far. It's basically the last like sizable stretch of mostly undeveloped wilderness here in Tatnik. So right around here is pretty much the exact land that the author, the driver, and Mr. Porter were traveling across back in 1888. This right here is probably the most striking natural feature in the area. It's called Rattlesnake Ledge, a big collection of glacial boulders that got dumped here thousands of years ago. And hey, you know why this place is called Rattlesnake Ledge? Because apparently back in the day, this was the very last place where rattlesnakes still lived in the Worcester area before they were completely exterminated by humans. Hey, wait just a minute. You guys see that cave up there? I don't know, it's pretty far up there. I don't know if you can see it on the camera or not. Okay, so this has absolutely nothing to do with the topic at hand, but I just saw that cave up there from the bottom of the ledge, way down there. So I've just been kind of climbing up these rock piles the last few minutes, because I heard something, I heard something kind of crazy about a cave that's supposed to be in this area, and I wasn't planning on trying to go find it, but that might be the cave. So consider this a little bonus feature in the video. Okay, I almost died 19 times climbing up here, but I think this is, this might be our cave. Please don't jump on me, gigantic spider. 
a smaller spider. Oh my god, it is this cave. There it is. Do you see that? L M. Wow. Wow. So I didn't do any research into what the LM is or anything like that. I literally just saw somebody mention it offhand in uh, some like blog post or something like that. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, but there's no way I'll be able to actually find that. But I actually found it. Holy cow. So yeah, somebody, somebody carved that in there a long, long time ago. Now I have to get back down here without dying. Well, that's that, I guess. I definitely did not expect to do that, but not complaining. Back to the article. Eventually, the buggy came to a place in the road where several logs had fallen across the path, blocking it completely. So the three men tied up their horses and continued up the road on foot. Before they got too far, Mr. Porter asked to stop so he could take off his shoes and socks and have a look at his feet. What, are you going to uncover your feet? exclaimed the driver in a tone of dismay, backing up the road. Why, yes, said the serene old gentleman. I like to have you take a look at them, too. There, how's them for legs? Wouldn't think they grew on the same man, would you? Well, now, some days them ankles will be the same size, and then again, one is twice as big as the other. I'm trying the new salve today for the first time. Been trying old Dr. Gathmery's salve, but it was too much like lard. This hangs on more. It's strong, too. Mr. Porter, having taken his stockings off and replaced his feet in his shoes, stood up and put the stockings in the rear pocket of his swallowtail. Oh man, so, so much good stuff again here, right? Like, why is the driver so afraid of feet that he's literally backing away down the road like he's faced with a wild animal? And, and maybe the trouble Mr. Porter's been having with his feet is because he goes hiking with no socks. Like, it, it's just so fun to picture this, right? Like, I mean, pretty much in this exact spot right here over 130 years ago mr porter walked up this hill in an antique suit jacket wearing a beaver hat with his socks hanging out his back pocket by the way before i go back to our article i should probably tell you that from here on out we're going to be pretty much retracing the exact steps of our trio of heroes from the article or at least as best as i could figure out their route as the three travelers hiked up the hill they eventually came to a gate Presently, we came around a bend in the road and saw before us a most remarkable gateway for such a neighborhood. On either side was a massive tower of solid stone, four feet square and seven feet high, capped with an overlapping top piece and forming an entrance as impressive as that of any private grounds in this part of the country. Okay, so I've walked up and down the cart path here about 10 times now, trying to see if I can find any remnants of those two stone towers that made up the gate. And I'm pretty sure they must've just been like hauled away at some point or something like that. Cause like this is, over here is the closest possibility. This is definitely a footprint of some kind of structure. It seems a little bit too, too wide for the towers that were described in the newspaper article, but it's possible this has something to do with it. But I think, What's more likely is that they were just knocked down and the stone was hauled away to be used somewhere else at some point. Because if you've ever hiked in New England or anything, you know that there's a bunch of three foot tall stone walls still dotting the entire landscape that are still there. So if those are there, then those two stone towers should be also. The gate between these two towers was down and we passed through readily over the ruins into a little open space among the trees. At one side was the ruins of what had evidently once been a rude stone house, and which was pointed out as the former residence of the Hermit Clark.
men continued along the path. Directly in front was the temple. It was a curious edifice, six-sided and with a low roof rising to a point in the center. Six massive pillars, about eight feet high, had been built of stone after the manner of those at the gate. The spaces between them had been filled with pieces of sheet iron, which looked as if they had been flattened out from sections of stovepipe, while the roof was covered with slabs. The space between two of the pillars was left open to form an entrance, and we went in. There was the remains of a large bonfire in the middle of the bare ground, which made up the floor. Okay, so it is worth noting, I found some pretty drastically different depictions of this temple through my research. Like, in this version, written in 1900 by naturalist Thomas Higginson, the temple is shaped like a square, not a hexagon. I also read that at one point the temple had slabs on the outside of it listing things like Thou shalt not kill and peace on earth. And I even heard that the roof got blown off once in a windstorm, and Solomon just decided to leave it that way for a while, so it could be like an open-air temple. So I guess the point here is that uh, all of those are pretty gigantic changes, so I wouldn't be surprised if Solomon built multiple iterations of his temple over the years, because that would explain uh, how different all these depictions are. I don't think I'm going to be able to find any remnants of the actual temple. I heard that there's like just a little bit of it left, basically like a couple of like foot tall hunks of mortar randomly out in the woods that just vaguely show the shape of the temple but i've been smashing my way around these woods for like an hour now in the general area of where the temple is supposed to be and i don't think i'm going to be able to find anything concrete to show you but that's okay all that was left of the temple was just a couple of hunks anyway the more important part is just the woods themselves because that's what solomon was really interested in he called this place forest sanctuary okay so there's a chance this is it too these rocks here are definitely arranged intentionally and there's also a rock right here that clearly has holes drilled into it so it could be right around here somewhere too that the temple used to stand but i think it's gonna be gonna have to leave it at a mystery as the three men entered the temple and sat down the author began to ask questions about mr parsons what is mr parsons doctrine what does he preach? Oh, he don't preach. And his doctrine is most anything. When the Methodists come up, he's Methodist. When the spiritualists come, he talks spiritualist. It's all one and the same to him. That's awesome, isn't it? Guy just wants people to come to his temple. He'll make the service about whatever his attendees want. Just wants them to feel happy and satisfied. Anything from Bible passages to holding seances. Mr. Porter continued to explain Solomon's history with religion. Solomon was a Millerite, and the night they were all going up, he sent for his daughter, who was away. Okay, so that probably sounds like complete nonsense to those of you who don't know what a Millerite is, so let me just give you like a super brief intro. William Miller was a preacher in the 1830s and 40s whose primary message was that the second coming of Christ and subsequent end of the world was going to happen in 1844. Now there's way, way, way more to his story than that, but for now I'm going to leave it there just to keep this video on topic. Anyway though, as you can probably guess, Solomon Parsons got wrapped up into Millerism, and that's actually how his temple here came about. It was originally built to protect him and his family during the apocalypse. He thought that it being a place of worship would pro provide some kind of protection. But just in case, he also fortified it with a bunch of steel and iron. That's why I had the sheet iron stuck on the outside of it in our author's description. I even found one description of the temple that talked about how the immediate area around it was just like full of excess iron and metal lying all over the place that Solomon was planning to use to fortify the temple. Don't you just love that? That's got to be like one of my favorite tidbits in this whole story. Like he's basically just like, hmm, as the end of the world draws near, I will build this temple which will protect us from the apocalypse through sheer holy sanctity and religious energy. But just in case, I got this sheet metal. <laughs> Mr. Porter continues with his description of Solomon Parsons' life, this time after 1844, when the world didn't end as Miller predicted. Well, since that time he's taken different notions, the most particular being that he couldn't eat no flesh nor use anything that came along of killing flesh. So he drives around in rope harness. They say his wife had a hard time of it because she didn't take any stock in the meat business, but that don't make no odds, because she's been dead 
this eight years. Solomon Parson's wife was a woman named Sarah Hasey Child, the granddaughter of a German Hessian soldier who came to the United States in the American Revolution. Unfortunately, I was not able to find much of anything about her life, except that she apparently had a wonderful talent for growing plants. I found all sorts of praise in horticulture magazines for her efforts in raising fruits and flowers. By the way, before we move on here, I feel like I need to mention that Solomon Parson's strong moral convictions went a lot further than just his vegetarianism. Like, he was also a staunch abolitionist, meeting with very famous anti-slavery figures like Sojourner Truth, and apparently at one point his house was even a stop along the Underground Railroad. Continuing with his stories, Mr. Porter tells the author that Solomon used to own a lot more land in the area, but that he had given a lot of it away, some to his daughter, some to his son, and some to God. Mr. Porter then offered to show the author the deed that Solomon had written up for his land donation to God. They walked out of the temple and through the woods. Everybody ready? I'm pretty sure this is the way to the deed across these rocks here. I thought there was supposed to be like a trail to it somewhere, but I didn't see one. So I just am going in the direction that I'm pretty sure it is. Oh man. of letters carved right into the face of this It's been like 170, 180 years since this thing was carved, so it's not as legible as it used to be, but it's, you can definitely still make out a lot of the words. I'm hoping it's coming across in the camera. Here, you can see it better when it's kind of in my shadow. I did find some old pictures of Deed Rock from books that are like you know, 90, 100 years old, so the pictures in there are a lot more clear. I'll flash those on the screen so you can get a, a better picture of what Deed Rock used to look like before it started to get eroded so much. This thing is absolutely massive, by the way. <laughs> lines and lines and lines. You can probably tell, too, that they actually, like, blasted this flat face of the rock off. Like, it used to connect right here from here to here. And they just chiseled and blew a big hunk off so they had a, a flat surface to, to, to put the deed into. Look right there, you can see it says Worcester. Pretty amazing, right? This massive thing is still sitting out here over 150 years later. So here's how this deed was supposed to work, right? Like Solomon Parsons paid 125 bucks to a guy who used to own this land, William Hall. And instead of submitting the regular paperwork that would transfer ownership from Hall to Solomon, they just had a guy named Sylvester Ellis spend the next few months out here in the woods carving the stone. And that's kind of all they did. They didn't actually submit any paperwork or anything. So from what I've read, in the eyes of the law, this land just like stayed the property of the original owner, William Hall. The government never saw any paperwork saying anything different. So to them, it was still William Hall's land. Hey everybody, I'm just back at my house now. I'm going through the footage, editing, and I just realized that I forgot to say something. 
You might have been wondering what the point of this deed was, like why Solomon wanted to give this land to God in the first place. And basically it was just like another way that he was trying to shield the area from the apocalypse, right? Like this is the same land the temple was on. And so he thought by giving the land over to God that it would afford it more protection. Oh, and also if you're wondering what the language of the deed is like, basically it's just like any other deed of the area except for replace like the name of the person who the land was going to with God instead. So it says stuff like, I, George Hall, am giving this land to God to be ruled by God, etc., etc. All right, that's it. Back to the live footage. After seeing the deed, the party of three went to visit Solomon Parsons' house, but unfortunately he was at Cape Cod visiting family. Afterwards, they went to visit Mr. Clark, the hermit. Upon meeting him, the author remarked that Mr. Clark just seemed like any other young man, living normally, working, socializing, and even teaching music lessons. Hey, by the way, you know what happened to this land after Solomon Parsons died? A guy named Abel Swan Brown built a vacation home on it. Here is what's left of that home. And here's what it used to look like back in the day. You know what they called this house? The Hermitage. <laughs> Poor Mr. Clark, right? Like not only is he literally the dictionary definition of hermit in Worcester, but now people are naming their vacation homes after how much of a hermit he supposedly was. Poor guy just can't catch a break. After meeting the hermit, the driver and the author decide to depart Tatnik and start heading back to Boston. They said their goodbyes to Mr. Porter and began to drive down the road. But before they get too far, they hear a shout from behind and turn to see Mr. Porter running after the carriage. Apparently, he had forgotten to tell them something. Panting and out of breath, he runs up to the carriage. I forgot to say, if you should come across anything new in the salve line, I should like terribly to know it. Will you? You will? I shall be de- But before Mr. Porter could get too deep into his request, the horse started moving on its own, pulling the carriage away and cutting the speech short. As the buggy rumbled down the road, the author looked back just one last time to see Mr. Porter standing in the street with his beaver hat on, a big smile on his face. Hey, that's the end of our article and the story of Deed Rock. Sure met a lot of colorful characters along the way, huh? Solomon Parsons, Mr. Porter, the hermit, the driver, but out of all of them, I think my favorite is actually just our author. You know, he writes about all these eccentrics, these big personalities with so much care. There's not even like a hint of mocking anywhere in this article. Uh, the guy clearly recognizes the humor in these personalities and their actions, but it's always written with this tone of like celebration, right? Like we should all be happy that people like this exist in our world. And we should be even happier to see the marks they leave in this world for us to find. So. Author, whoever you are, unfortunately I wasn't able to find his name anywhere. Thank you for writing this article. Thank you for watching.